But today we're going to talk about how a five foot two woman destroyed the Quran. And indeed, she did. Who is that woman? And why are we talking about her? Well, I'll let Dr. J answer that question. Greeting everyone, this is Al-Fadi. Welcome back to a continuation of our assessment of early Quranic manuscripts and how those manuscripts basically are so damaging to the history of Islam and the Quran in this case. But today we're going to talk even beyond just the manuscript. We're going to talk about the so-called Qira'at readings, variant readings, if you wish. And we really titled it very simply this, how a five foot two woman, I would like to call her a woman of God, destroyed the Quran. And indeed, she did. Who is that woman? And why are we talking about her? Well, I'll let Dr. J answer that question. Dr. J, tell us more. Okay, to understand, we need a little bit of background. Now, for what the Muslims are telling us is that there, as we said in our previous episodes, there is an eternal Quran, has always existed, sent down over a period of 22 years from 610 to 632, and was finalized and written down during the time of Uthman in 652. And for the last 1400 years, not one letter, not one word has changed. Those are the four claims, right? If those are the four claims, you kept, I, I said from the very beginning of these episodes, we need to find those manuscripts. And if we find anything that shows that there are different words, different letters that would destroy the whole notion of what the Quran is saying in chapter 85, verse 22, in chapter 10, verse 15, chapter 18, verse 27, and chapter 15, verse 9. Well, here this five foot woman named Hatu Tosh. She's my colleague. She has worked with me since 2013. Almost nine years we've worked together. She is the one that took over my ministry and I gave it to her when I left London uh, in 2017. And she has been going by leaps and bounds way beyond what I was able to do. But back in 2013, she came across six or seven of these Qurans in North Africa that were different, all Arabic. And she said, something's wrong here. We can't have different Qurans. And so she was the one that brought him home. And I said, well, let's take him down to Speaker's Corner. So we took him down to Speaker's Corner. Look at there is only one Quran, right? And that every Quran in the world is the same. That's what you've been told. You have been told a lie! You run away from truth! Okay, so there are two Qurans today, right? Two! More than two Qurans! More than two? Three Qurans? More than three? Four Qurans? There are approximately 26 of the Qurans! 26 different Qurans! here and I want to show you this slide. Here's the slide of us down at Speaker's Corner, the ones on the left. There we are holding him up, our team. That's Hatun Tosh on the bottom slide with the glasses, yeah, with her mouth open, saying stop it because they're trying to grab these, these facsimiles that we show of example after example. We took about maybe 25 of these examples and started going through them, show them how different they were. And of course, it, the crowd just could not stand it. They were just grabbing them, trying to tear them. Fortunately, we had laminated them so they would not tear. But look over on the right. Look at the guy that's on the right. That's Muhammad Hijab. Right. 
He was there and he saw this and he realized what was going on. He quickly went outside the crowd and he started calling all the Muslims to join him, to leave what we were showing. He said, do not look at what they're showing you. Do not listen to what they were saying. So he pulled the crowd towards him. That happened in 2016, June of 2016. These 26 Qurans were all found by uh, Hatun Tosh. She found them going to Morocco, going to Jordan, and I think she also went to Yemen, those three countries. Evidently, you can buy them all over. I have nine of them in my library. You, I've shown them many times. Uh, these are all Arabic. They are all 114 surahs, and they all come from the 8th, 9th, and 10th century. So they're over a 1,000 years old, these Qurans, not the ones we have today. They are now newly pu published. So these, this came, became such a problem, you can see back then, caused such a furore. So we went actually and did this three different times. Now, what happened? That was 2016. Let's come forward now or come uh, more recently to 2020. And I want to show you this slide here. So let's go to this slide here and look at this uh, picture of Muhammad Hijab on the left and Dr. Yasser Qadi on the right. They did an interview about this problem. He had to find out. Dr. Yasser Qadi is a world leading authority on the Qira'at. He did his doctoral thesis on this very subject, you know, on the Quran at Yale University, graduated in 1995. So he would be the world authority on the Qira'at. So Muhammad Hijab needed to go to him. And uh, what is your position in relation to preservation of Quran? Is, for example, Hafsa and Asim, the way Hafsa and Asim, do you see it as preserved Munazzal from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or do you not see that as Munazzal? What's your Jayid. position? Jayid. Okay, so uh, first and foremost, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَلْ ذِكْرَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ so we yeah. believe as a matter of theology, as a matter of aqeed, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preserved the Quran, no question about it. Now, as for the issue itself, Every single student of knowledge knows who studies ulum al-Qur'an that the most difficult topics are ahruf and qira'at and the concept of ahruf and the reality of ahruf and the relationship of the Uthmanic Mus'haf with the ahruf and the preservation of the ahruf. Is it one? Is it three? Is it seven? And the relationship of the qira'at to the ahruf. This is a topic that when you're the beginning, beginning student of knowledge, you're like, what is all of this going on here? When you go a little bit more, you learn to simply memorize what your teachers say and regurgitate it out. And you don't fully comprehend. When you do a deep dive is when things get very, very awkward and difficult. And this isn't new. This is from the time of the Sahaba. And this is not a joke, brothers and sisters. The issue of Ahruf and Qiraat caused confusion to somebody whom the Prophet said, if you want to listen to the Quran directly, listen to Ubay. Ubay. I mentioned the crises that happened to me at Yale. My first year at okay. Yale. It wasn't a crisis yeah. of faith, by the way. So I was very clear about this. People misinterpreted. It was a crisis of my understanding of knowledge. It was a crisis okay. of what my teachers taught me. Alhamdulillah, okay. alhamdulillah, as somebody who memorized the Quran as a teenager, alhamdulillah, in my entire life, I have never doubted that the Quran is divine. You cannot doubt that. Any, you listen okay. to it, you recite it, you just cannot doubt that. It's never been an issue. This no. was the issue. That... The issue of ahruf and preservation and qiraat and relationships between them, these are very, very difficult issues. And the most advanced of our scholars, they're not quite fully certain how to solve all of the unanswered questions in there. These issues should only be discussed amongst people who know what the qiraat are and who understand yeah. some of these questions that are being so, raised. So Traditional really understandings of Ahruf and Qiraat cannot answer some of these pressing questions that are now being poked by our uh, people outside of, by our academics, not our, by their academics outside of the faith tradition. You see, in a Muslim environment, there's always some respect that we have for the Quran. We should. In a Muslim environment, we'll press a little bit, and then we'll say, okay, khalas, sami'na wa ata'na. And that's great, alhamdulillah. When you go to academia, they don't have that red line. And they're going to just, you know, the, 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 the famous story of the emperor with no clothes. They're going to just point out, no, that doesn't make any sense. Well, that's not true. And this and that. And they'll bring issues, which I'm not going to mention explicitly, that you know are true because they're in your own books. They're not inventing anything new. And it's very clear to you and to every single very advanced student and specialist that the standard narrative 
has holes in it. That's what I'm going to say. The standard narrative does not answer some very pressing questions. You know, these are now well known within the Western uh, Academy uh, that they're bringing forth issues. Their level of now knowledge is leaps and bounds above what it used to be. You know, hundred years ago. You know, and by and large, our ulama in the Eastern world are not aware, by and large, of what's going on in the Western side of things. And they're not answering those questions in a manner that it needs to be answered. And this is something all of us that are in academia fully acknowledge. We actually have issues of the relationship, of the origins, of the ikhtilaf and all of this should only be discussed amongst those who are familiar with this science. And it takes a while. I can't answer this question in a 20 minute interview, nor is yeah, it wise okay, okay. to do so, which is why I never brought this topic up myself. You will not find one lecture of mine about this issue. It should never be brought up in public. And I don't like these idiots and they are idiots. Wallahi. This is not something you discuss amongst the masses. Ya akhi. It's not wise. You don't understand. Yeah. Let it be. It's wise. That's why I never did it. It's and the Western academics. These, these problems are now becoming mainstream. Twitter has so many accounts of, Quran experts and they're non-Muslims and they're just saying things. Let me ask you one question to try and make this as specific as possible. I think if I were to give you a blank mushaf, yeah, and uh, and tell you to write what is munazzal verbatim from Allah into that mushaf with no human interference, would you write something which corresponds? It's with not an easy answer. It's not an easy yes or no. It is enough for the Muslim to believe. I Quran think this should be an easy yes or no, though. Yes, Al Khadi. I, I have to. Okay, very, very well. So, yeah, Muhammad, after we get off this phone call, me and you, let's have a number of discussions. No problem. I'm very yes. open with advanced students. But these issues should not. Look, it is Kalamullah, what is going to be written. It is Kalamullah. What, 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 what would you write? Uh, 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 let's not. Let, let's, you, you're pushing me. And I'm saying it's not hikmah. To listen, I have a condition, like I said, everything I say is going to be factual. The Quran is the uncreated speech of Allah. The Quran is preserved. The Quran is known. The Quran is mutawatir. And alhamdulillah, all of the qiraat are the Quran. All of the qiraat are authentic. Alhamdulillah. Leave it at that, ya akhi. Beyond this, honestly, I have no problem. We'll have discussions or take my class. It okay. is enough for the Muslim to know that the Quran is the speech of Allah that has been protected. And what we recite is the kalam of Allah. That is enough for the Muslims. Yeah, but then, if I, if I could push back here just a little bit, I know, I know this is, I don't want to make it uncomfortable, but it's just, just to make things clearer. Like if, okay. if, if someone gave you a Quran, which is empty in terms of, there's, no, there's nothing on it, and gave you a pen, obviously you have the Quran, but the question is, would what you write in that Mus'haf correspond with any, anything that we have in terms of, the riwayat and the qiraat is if okay, who's going to bring a new Quran? We're going to have the Quran yeah. there, but which Quran will it be in? It'll be probably a mixture, right? It's not going to be That's necessarily. Fine. Yeah, okay. So let's leave it at that. Then. It's gonna. It's not going to be the exact Hafsa and Asim bi riwayat fulan or Shu'ba. But you would Just have like something which you could say is is Sahih, Rec fully recognizable by the average Muslim. Obviously, anything bizarre. Yeah. So when you write, so yeah, so so just to be clear, if you write down. It might not be a standard Hassan Asim. Exactly, exactly, but, yes, but, yes. But what you it write down will be, is recognizable and you believe, and you believe that everything within that is munazzal min Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 100% yeah. as Allah is my witness, 100%. That is the I just put here 12 points that came up in that interview. Let's go through them real quickly, one by one by one by one, to unpack what happened on June 8, 2020. Number one, he put his hand out and he says, which of the Qur'ans that we now have today was the one that was received by Muhammad, which is the one that's in, that's in heaven. So he knew that there were different Qur'ans. He knew that these did not agree. That's obvious, otherwise he wouldn't ask this question. Exactly, he definitely was troubled by something and that's why he's asking that question. Because we had shown that, because the very next day after we did that, we actually, Hatun and I did a whole two hours of unpacking all of the 30 Qur'ans and showing example to him from example how each one of them disagreed with the Huff's text. We just did that off the top of our head and in two hours and that went up and that went viral. So he said, this is what what Yasser Qadi, now look at the number one. Number one, Yasser Qadi immediately came back. Is the, well, well, this is what Mohammed Hijab first said. This is this problem with the Hafs in the Warsh and also the Kirat in the Ahruf is the most popular question we're getting. We've got to have an answer, Yasser Qadi. And Yasser Qadi said that this Ahruf and this Kirat has been the most difficult problem for the last 
thousand years. The most difficult problem for all the scholars. He says, when a Muslim or when someone converts to Islam, we don't tell them about it. When they become intermediate, then we tell them just to memorize it and not to question it and just regurgitate it out again. Mm -hmm. When they become advanced scholars like you and me, then we do a deep dive. Take my course, he kept on saying. Take my course and you can do the deep dive. But do not film me now about this question. <clears throat> the reason why is because of what happened to him. Muhammad Hijab said, well, is this your crisis of faith that you had back in 1995 at Yale? And he recoiled and said, no, 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 not a crisis of faith, a crisis of knowledge, a crisis of understanding, which obviously is a crisis of faith. That caused the crisis of faith. It caused a crisis of faith for Muhammad Hijab. He didn't know what to tell those people outside of, the, of, of that crowd. So he said, we, therefore, we cannot doubt it. We must listen to it and we must recite it. It's almost like he was trying to persuade himself not to get back to this crisis again. It was fascinating to watch. He said, Muslims have a respect for the Quran, he said. And he says, we, there are certain questions we don't ask of the Quran. But when I was at Yale University getting my doctorate, there are no red lines. Right. See, in Islam, there are red lines. You don't go beyond, but not at Yale University, not here in the West. There are no red lines, and therefore all these questions were being asked. He was being inundated with them, and he didn't know how to answer him. So he said, this is a real problem. And, and then <clears throat> he turned to Muhammad Hijab, and he says, you in the East, Muhammad Hijab's living in London. I thought it was fascinating. He called in the East. What you're saying is 99% of the Quran Muslims live in the East. That means the rest of the Muslim world versus me who lives in the West in Houston. You in the East... Your standard narrative has holes in it. Immediately when he said that, I started clapping. Now we've grabbed that phrase that he said, and we have made it now a meme. Standard Islamic narrative has holes in it, the S-I-N. Right. And he was the one that mentioned that back on June 8th, has holes in it. And this became his signature piece. Now he said that Western academics, <clears throat> he says, we have a real problem in the West because Western academics have come leaps and bounds since uh, the last hundred years. And they're looking at us Muslims as if we had the emperor with no clothes. <laughs> It. What imagery that he was using this. He didn't realize that we were all watching this interview. <laughs> and he could, went on to say that the Kirat should never, therefore, be brought up in public. Never. This must be something we keep behind closed doors. Because no one would understand it, he said. And then he started almost being proudful. He says, in the last 25 years, I, you have never seen me talk about this. You will never see me talk about this in public. However... However, after this recording, you can come and take, we can talk about it. And Osorni, you can take my class, which to me is an oxymoron. If he's never talked about it, why would I want to take his class? Obviously, he doesn't know how to answer this question. And he wasn't answering it during this interview. And then he says, in 25 years since my time at Yale University, I've never talked about this subject, nor will I ever. However, take my class, take my class, and I'll tell you everything about it. And then he went into this kind of mantra. The Quran is the uncreated speech of Allah. It is preserved. The Quran is known. The Quran is mutawatir. He, it, it was, you could see it was a memorized speech that I hear Muslims doing all the time. From Yehai to the gas over, this is what they're told. It is the uncreated speech. It is inimitable. It is preserved. It is known. It is mutawatir. That means there is, from the very beginning till today, there are no changes. Not one word, not one letter has changed. It is exactly the same that that which is preserved in heaven. They have almost memorized it, and they are almost in a trance when they say it. He went into that. He did this mantra right there in front of us. And I said, this is exactly what we want to see. They do not want to get beyond that mantra. They cannot, they dare not get outside that comfort, that red line that they cannot go beyond. And then he says that when he, uh, uh, Muhammad Ijal asks a second time, puts out his hand, I'm giving you a blank sheet now. He's been listening to all, this is almost about 28 minutes later. Puts us out his hand and he says, okay, yes, Arkadi, please tell me which of these kirat, which are you going to write? Kadi recoiled again. Do not ask me this question. Finally, after 28 minutes, he finally had to acquiesce. And guess what he said? They are all the Quran. That's right. So Muhammad said, you mean 
parts of the house and parts of, yes, parts of the house gonna be there, some of the wash is gonna be there, maybe some of the kaloon, maybe some of the kasai. You just take them and you mix them around, you mix them around, and that's the crown that we get today. And I just started clapping because I realized neither did Yasakadi or Mama Nijab know what we know. There are over 90, 93,000 differences between these 30 different Qurans, all in Arabic, all over a thousand years old. No wonder this has been the most difficult question. But in that one felt sweep, he destroyed the preservation of the Quran in that one interview. All because of a five foot two inch woman who introduced it there at Speaker's Corner, filmed it so the whole world could see it back on June 8th, 2016. And uh, it was amazing indeed, and we praise the Lord for you, your ministry, her ministry, and uh, for those who are laboring uh, to bring the truth to our Muslim friends. And we pray also for Muhammad Hijab, we pray for Yasser Qadi, we pray for others who I'm sure they're well-meaning in, in what they are trying to explain, but sadly, uh, they, they're not standing on the truth. They're not standing on a solid foundation. What are we going to talk about next time? Dan Brubaker. So now we're going to go from a five-foot-two woman to a six-foot man who destroyed the Quran even better than what Hatun Trash did. And uh, we'll talk about that uh, in the next episode uh, when it comes to Dr. Brubaker, obviously, because uh, really he, he's the most gentle person you'll ever meet. And uh, with that in mind, uh, we will wait until next time. Thank you, everyone. God bless. Thank you.